Hello, welcome to Living and Dying, the program that gives you news and information about the people and the services at Brattleboro Area Hospice. My name is Richard Ewald. I'm a hospice volunteer. Our topic for today is bereavement which is another way of saying grief, that overwhelming loss that we experience upon the death of a loved one, family member, a pet, or someone we know in the community and value. Joining us here today is Elizabeth Pittman. She is the bereavement coordinator for Brattleboro Area Hospice. Hi, it's Hi. nice to be here. Thank you for having me. You will be welcome and thank you for coming. Why do we use the word bereavement instead of the word grief? I mean, where does it even come from? The, the root of the word bereavement or bereft means shorn off or robbed. And certainly when people have a big loss, they can feel robbed. They can feel that, that something has been snatched away from them. Um, so it's, and it's used interchangeably with mm -hmm. the word grief and sometimes even with the word mourning. The mourning can refer to sort of our cultural and religious uh, rituals around expressing our mm -hmm. grief. Well, given how different we all are and given the different kinds of losses we've experienced, how does Brattleboro Area Hospice react to all those differences and all those needs? Um, we have a bereavement program that goes back about as far as our hospice does, which is over 30 years old. Uh, and I, I think that people wonder sometimes how bereavement fits with um, a hospice mission because when people hear hospice they think about dying and death. But at hospice we feel like there are many people involved when one person is dying. And though one person dies, a number of people are left. And it is part of our mission to follow up with those folks after a death. Uh, and go ahead. Well, that's that's wonderful because it's um, you're not leaving someone in the lurch. So a family member who's been through the death of a, of, of someone they love, um, at the end of that process, they're not left all alone wondering what happens next. That's right. Uh, it, we feel like there's a variety of ways that we can maybe show up and be helpful. Um, always following the lead of the person who's grieving. Some people need much less than other people. Uh, some people are, are only interested in accessing us for a very brief time after a death. Um, and some folks don't show up until five or six months later when they are suddenly having a harder time than they expected to have. So I, I understand that someone who was with a family member who was going through the dying process would already be in touch with hospice. But for someone who has not had a family member go through that experience with Brattleboro Area Hospice, is it still possible for them to receive some services and some support? Absolutely. Uh -huh. Particularly because we're a small population area, there's not another grief center, if you will, that's available. And so anyone in our community who has had a death loss, and that can be of a family member, of a friend, of somebody who lives at a distance. Um, it can be from any cause. So maybe somebody died at a distance with hospice care. Maybe someone died in an accident. We've had uh, suicide loss support groups for survivors after a suicide. Um, and, and we provide uh, support to individuals, to families, and sometimes to groups in the community um, who've had a particular, maybe a, a, a co-worker has died. And it's been, particularly when it's been surprising, when it's been sudden and unexpected, sure. uh, um, sometimes those folks need even a little more support uh, than someone who's gotten support all along as their family member was sure. dying. So if I'm in that situation and I call 257-0775, what's the next thing that happens? Um, if you say that somebody's died and you're looking for support, uh, either I at Extension 104 or Muriel Wolf, who's our bereavement volunteer coordinator, mm -hmm. um, 
will be contacted and brought into the situation. I can meet with anybody out of the community one to three times to help a person um, sort of assess what might be most helpful for them. For some people, it's coming and meeting a time or two with me. Um, for other people, um, maybe a support group would be a helpful thing. So we have an ongoing support group for people who've lost a spouse or partner. We have an ongoing twice a month support group for bereaved parents who've had mm -hmm. a child die. Um, we have eight week groups that start every so often. So I'm actually, we're recording this in late February. I'm ending a group tonight and in a few weeks I'll start a new eight week group. For people who've had a parent, a sibling, um, a friend, maybe a coworker die, um, when there's a need, when there's enough people who are interested, we might have a traumatic loss group or a suicide loss group. We do that every so often. Mm -hmm. And we also provide groups in the community when there are four more children or teens who are interested. Um, so Elizabeth Ungerleiter is our um, sort of child and teen bereavement coordinator, and she's right now offering a group at Kern Hatton. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like uh, Brattleboro Area Hospice can respond in so many different ways at so many different levels. And how long does that process go on with any particular person? That's a great question. Um, we follow up with people for over a year, uh, usually maybe 15 months. Mm -hmm. And that follow up may be, um, actually let me show you, we, we give to anybody that we meet with or send to any of our hospice family members or anybody else who asks. Um, several things, we have a brochure about our bereavement services. We have um, a, a booklet called When You Love Has Died that uh, anybody in the community who um, has lost a loved one might be interested in. And we have a newsletter that comes out every other month. And in the newsletter are articles and poems, um, and we encourage people to submit them, and so often they're written by people in the community. And then inside, there's always a section that lists the support groups we offer and other support activities throughout the year that we offer. What is someone likely to be feeling at such a time? Uh, I use the word overwhelming. Um, but I, it seems to me that the range of emotions can be really extreme and, and an individual to each person. Um, for example, today is a beautiful day in late February. It almost feels like spring. The, what, the sky is blue, the sun is shining, and yet I can imagine that if I had just suffered a great loss, I would be offended by the beautiful weather, by the birds singing. I would mm -hmm. want everything to be raining outside, just like it's raining in my heart. Mm -hmm. Or I could, so there could be anger in there. I, could, I just be, could be paralyzed. Um, so it sounds like there's almost different things that people need to do or to experience, and um, it sounds like such variation. I still can't get my head around. How can you do it all? Um. Well, a little bit like the recovery community, one step at a time. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right, there is an enormous range. We think of grief, a lot of times people think of grief, as sort of sorrow and sadness. And that can certainly be part of it, although not necessarily. Mm -hmm. And um, But there's a huge range, not only of feelings, um, we're really affected on every level by grief. And so it may be that what bothers a person most is their thinking seems muddled, they have a hard time making decisions, they feel confused. Um, I think that's one of the reasons people are encouraged not to make great big decisions after a big change like this. It's very disorienting to have a big loss. Um, and it takes a while to right ourselves after being so upended. You use 
uh, one of my favorite analogies for grief, which is it's like having weather on the inside. Mm -hmm. And the weather on the inside doesn't necessarily match the weather on the outside. Um, I had someone come to me after Katrina and say that the images that I saw on the television, that's what I'm feeling mm -hmm. in the face of the loss of my husband for, for this particular person. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, um, you know, that's something to be aware of, and it's one of the... Grief can be, feel isolating, and it can feel isolating because we feel so different than what seems to be going on around mm -hmm. us. Um, it can feel like my world has stopped, and yet I look out the window, the cars go by as always, and other people seem to be rolling They're along. They're all behaving normally, yes. and my whole world has changed. How That's, can that be? Yes. Well, it sounds like some people could benefit simply from sympathetic listening. I need someone to talk to about this. Mm -hmm. But I can also imagine not wanting to talk at all. Yes. And when that's the case, what if, I, if I'm just so bound up, I don't want to talk about anything, what gets me out of that? What helps me out of that moment? Well, first of all, I encourage people not to beat themselves up about being in a place like that. Mm -hmm. When we have an enormous loss that we're not in control of, because if we'd been in control of it, it would have gone oh, a very would, different would way. Happened, happened. Exactly. It, it becomes very important to control what we can. Mm -hmm. And and therefore you get fights over the silly cracked blue bowl mm -hmm. that that suddenly takes on this great importance because mama's gone and we can't have her, and so now this smaller thing becomes very important sometimes to, to control. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I want to just talk about this. Maybe I want to talk about why this bowl is just so important to mm -hmm. me, and because I miss her, and the bowl meant so much. But if it's all too much, and I'm tongue-tied, and I almost don't want to be with anybody, right. um, how it, are there ways to move us out of that kind of stuck place? Yes. Uh -huh. and, and I started with, first of all, to embrace ourselves where we are, mm -hmm. and not to, that critic voice, we, we don't need so strongly right now. I should right be now. grieving in a different way. Exactly. Okay. Uh -huh. to, to be gentle with ourselves about, this is where I am right now, and maybe it's okay to be here for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, an entry point into our organization is to come and meet with me maybe a time or two. And, and we can think together about what might be useful. For some people, being in a support group is a heavenly thing. I got feedback from somebody just last week about the spouse loss group, what it's meant, how important it's been. That's not true for everybody. Uh -huh. We certainly, some people come and they're not ready to talk, but it helps them to listen to other people who are a little farther down the line. We also have trained bereavement volunteers. And so somebody who may or may not be interested in a group may also feel that additional need for one-on-one um, -on -one conversation that's mm -hmm. ongoing for a while. And so we match people with volunteers um, so that that can happen. Sort of as companions then, to go shopping or to gardening or yes. something like that? Um, uh, not shopping so much, every once in a while somebody will help with, you know, you have a lot of paperwork after oh, somebody yeah. dies. Yeah. So sometimes somebody will just sit with you while you organize things, or help you with going through things. Or, um, yes, just be available to listen. Sometimes people will come here to the office and meet with a bereavement volunteer just uh, um, for a getaway. And, and sometimes people will go for a drive, run errands, mm -hmm. do gardening, as you say. Um, with with someone else to be helpful in that way. You know, you mentioned the weather, and it seems to me that um, the weather takes its own good time. That sometimes it rains for a day, and sometimes it rains for a week. And I might be a little apprehensive that someone's going to come and take my weather away from me and try to fix me in some way that I don't yes. want. How do I know that's not going to happen? How do I know that it's going to be at the own at my own speed? 
whatever it is. Right. Well, you know as a hospice volunteer that we strongly encourage people to go at their own pace. And, um, you know, one of the reasons that we follow up with people for a year is that um, sometimes you might be doing a little better, you know. It, it, whatever the loss is, it's not the only thing going on in somebody's life. Mm -hmm. And it's not always front and center. But we know that, you know, sometimes when you hit a new season, when you come upon a holiday, when you come upon somebody else's birthday or your own birthday, that may be a trigger that um, brings you, brings it all back for you. Um, sometimes people have been sort of cruising along for a while and suddenly they start having dreams uh, about or somebody. Or into tears without or, any notice at all. Exactly. And then it's a good time to pick up the phone and say, you know, can you help me with what this might be about? So what if that thing that comes up just all on its own, something that happened 20 years ago. Is that still something that I could find out for if I were a hospice? Sure. Um, it, you know, if something like that comes up, it's knocking on the door of your psyche and asking to be mm -hmm. paid attention so to So it's really no different way. from anything that happened the day before in that way? No, no, yeah. it's not. Uh -huh. And, you know, for some people, it's just, it's helpful to read something. So we have a library here, and you know I brought a few a few books up. Just this is quite a random sampling, but um, this is a book for and about kids. Uh, that's the story of each kid, how it feels when a parent dies. Um, we have things that relate to different. Uh, um, this is Morning and Mitzvah. Um, it was written by a rabbi. It it has some great exercises and it has a wonderful section about um, writing a letter to a deceased loved one mm -hmm. and um, that can be helpful whether it was 20 years ago or 10 mm -hmm. years ago or last month. Um, so it may be sometimes people come and they just want to read one thing in particular mm -hmm. or they need one suggestion to run with and then that's the only contact that's that they, they feel like they mm -hmm. need. Talk a little bit about the annual um, service that hospice holds. Sure, I'd love to. We started a garden on the site of Living Memorial Park uh -huh, 15 years ago, amazingly to me. Mm -hmm. And we do a memorial planting service every year. It falls on the first Sunday in June, which I think is June 3rd this year. We do it at 1.30 in the afternoon. All ages come, dress really comfortably, plants are donated by the, all the farm stands and nurseries in town, the Hallowell singers come and sing while we put plants in the ground and we, you know, we use volunteers all kinds of ways and volunteers help with the garden so that it's prepared and it's very easy to come and put a plant in the ground and then we have stones that you can mark and put a little flat stone with the planting that you did. And then that's something that can be visited all throughout the growing season. Um, also in May, uh, about a month before we do the service, not quite that long, we will have um, a day when people can come and make remembrance flags. Mm -hmm. So even now, if you go by the garden, you'll see that there are flags that are hanging in remembrance of people, and we replenish those every year. Mm. Um, it sounds to me that this, this ceremony, and certainly the groups uh, that meet together, is another way to remind ourselves that we're not in this alone. Exactly. Exactly. Uh -huh. And that's... A really, I mean, I mentioned before that grieving can feel really isolating, mm -hmm. and um, so that's a really important time to learn. Mm -hmm. But it, but this hasn't happened only to me, um, and and I think particularly with some populations, certainly bereaved parents, certainly people after a suicide. Um, there's such particular challenges with those kinds of losses, and to be able to talk to somebody else who gets it uh -huh. at a really fundamental level, yes, it makes you feel less alone. 
And, and speaking of the, the group and things that happened to groups um, over the last several years, it seems that a couple of things have happened in Brattleboro that really impacted the whole community and, mm -hmm. and it really affected a lot of people. Is there a role for Brattleboro Area Hospice in helping the community deal with that sort of thing? There certainly is, um, or we're certainly available. Uh, sometimes people, you know, groups have it covered themselves, but every once in a while from, um, say, local nursing homes where a number of, of client, long-term clients die close together. I've gone and done support for staff. Um, early ed services some years back had a, a you know a, a death that uh, the staff needed support around um, this the tragedy that happened at the co-op last summer so different people call on us at different times sometimes it's it's a workplace where a co-worker has either been sick for a while or maybe suddenly died and People are at loose ends, and we can go and do one or two or three um, support sessions with them. Sometimes, uh, Rich, it's, um, I'm thinking of a couple of different school situations where what was important was for people who knew the child or children involved to be there to support them, but those people, those teachers or counselors, whatever, they needed support and backup and ongoing, you know, literature and ideas, and we're happy to be a resource in that way as well. Well, you know, I hadn't uh, really considered, when people think of hospice, we usually think about death and dying and what happens in the last bit of life, mm -hmm. and I think that um, this is a really great reminder and a recognition that this is something that's always with us. Mm -hmm. We've always all experienced losses mm -hmm. um, in the same way we'll all experience death. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it just seems like a really wonderful way that Brattleboro Area Hospice pairs up the two programs to provide support for people in the community around all of us. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. <laughs> you know, it's that whenever anything happens in our lives, we, you know, it's that balancing thing. Do we have the resources to deal with that? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, people have their faith communities. They have their families. They have their circle of friends. They have the ways they individually care for themselves. Um, going out into nature, riding your bike, taking a yoga class, you know. Um, but sometimes there's a need for a little more. And maybe it's because there have been several losses in a row. I was mm -hmm. okay with this one. I had enough support for this one, but now I'm in the over my head. Uh -huh. and, and that's what we're here for. What sustains you through all this work? And here you are, there's groups and individuals, the whole entire community, um, issues of loss, of death, and surely over the years, you've um, managed to find some way to work in that environment with people at these extremely vulnerable times in their lives and, um, and somehow be sustained by it mm -hmm. as well as sustain the programs themselves. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? Um, I have to actually practice what I preach. <laughs> so, um, you know, grieving people and me and everyone, we, we all need the same basic things. We, we need to eat well, we need to get enough rest, we need to put our bodies in motion. You know, I often say to people, motion is the biggest part of the word emotion. Mm -hmm. And even though you're not necessarily figuring it all out, just putting your, just going out for a walk shifts things and, and takes you to another place. Um, so I have to do those things. I I do Tai Chi with a wonderful teacher in town. I've sung with the Brattleboro Women's Chorus since its inception. Um, I love to garden, though I'm not very good at it. It doesn't matter just getting my hands in sure. the dirt and growing a few things, uh, getting away on occasion. Um, you know, I have to do things to take care of myself mm -hmm. too. And 
can then really encourage other people, you know, to start with yourself so that you've got something to give to other people. It's like what they say on the airplane. In the event of a loss of cabin pressure, if your oxygen mask comes down, you got to put yours on first. Um, it's something I say to parents a lot who have children who are grieving when a whole family is grieving, that each of us has to think a little bit about taking care of ourselves. Well, and in in, if I think of that metaphor, in the event, in the unlikely event of a water landing, yes. um, this is a water landing we know is going to occur. Yes. Um, as sobering as that is, it also sounds to me like all these examples you've just given are is the sort of thing that I would experience, I would learn about through these bereavement programs. I would come away from that with tools, with information, with examples of what I can do to begin to um, continue living in the face of this experience. Mm -hmm. We feel like our mission is both education and support. And, um, and we offer educational things in the community from time to time. We do an altar, the Day of the Dead altar, uh, around that time of year, which is mm -hmm. early November. Um, so we, it, we offer different kinds of educational things along with support. And as you know, uh, when as people get more involved but are a little further from a loss, they also might want to access our death and dying class or one of our volunteer trainings. We have a bereavement volunteer training every year. Um, so education is an important mm -hmm. um, Peace, so that I'm not just supported in the moment, sure. but um, I can carry this with me into other experiences in my life. Well, that sounds like uh, sort of a closing of a circle where folks who have been through the experience of, of grief and loss um, come back as bereavement volunteers. Um, it sounds like a really great way the Bradwater Area Hospice is supporting the community. And if you or a family member or someone you know sounds like this is the sort of thing that could help them through their difficult time, please contact Brattleboro Area Hospice, 257-0775, brattleborohospice.org, and you can find out what you need to know about bereavement services from the hospice organization. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Rich.